and the role that increased representation has played. I'm Joel Wenger, the political director for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, our president, Mark Melman, and board and board co-chairs, Ann Lewis and Todd Richman, welcome. We hope that you and your loved ones are well and staying healthy. I wanted to mention we have another one of these events coming up next Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time, entitled From the Classroom to Congress, Lessons on Service and Leadership with former educators and Democratic nominees, Carolyn Long and Dan Feehan. Before I turn it over to Mark Melman to introduce our distinguished guests, I'm going to go over a few items. If you like what you're hearing today, please check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The handle is on the screen. You can sign up for our news and updates on our website, dmfi.org. We'll take some questions during this event, and if you want to ask a question, submit it through the Q&A interface on your Zoom screen. If you're watching on Facebook Live and want to submit a question, you can type it into the comments box. And double checking to make sure this is true. Just checking in on captions for us tonight. All right, no problem. We are working to provide captions to those who are hearing impaired through Facebook and it may come up, but right now it appears the system is not working correctly. So I apologize for that. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Melman, our president and CEO, to introduce the event. Thank you very much, Joel. Thank you all very much for joining us this, this evening. Uh, as Joel said, this is the first in a series of debate-related events tonight. We're going to be so proud and privileged uh, to see our Democratic nominee for Vice President, Kamala Harris, uh, take the debate stage, uh, who will be the first female Vice President, the first person of color to serve as Vice President. And that's something that uh, is exciting and important uh, to all of us. Uh, for that reason, we wanted to focus on the empowerment of women, increasing empowerment of women in our political system. And I want to introduce uh, our co-chair, uh, my colleague and friend, Ann Lewis. Uh, Ann, as you may know, well, I, Ann came to, first to my attention uh, many years ago, more than we'd like to each remember, when she yeah. managed the campaign of her brother, uh, Barney Frank, uh, for Congress. And he won and spent many terms in Congress and went on to be the uh, political director of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, she ran the Women's Vote Project at the Democratic National Committee. Uh, she was a deputy campaign manager for the Clinton campaign, for President Bill Clinton's campaign. She served as communications director for President Clinton in the White House, and she served as a senior advisor to Hillary Clinton in a number of specific roles, <clears throat> excuse me, after the uh, uh, end of uh, President Clinton's administration. Uh, we're delighted and thrilled that she is a founder and a uh, co-chair of Democratic Majority for Israel. Our other co-chair, Todd Richmond, is with us. But I want to turn it over to Anne, who's going to uh, lead the panel, lead the discussion for us this evening. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, Mark, for that great introduction. And you only left out my happy years in the House, where I was chief of staff for then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski. So I know something about working on the Hill and what you all are, how hard you're working and what you're able to achieve. So again, good evening, as you've heard. Thanks to all of you who are tuning in. Uh, I am Ann Lewis. I'm co-chair of the DMFI's Board of Directors, and it is my honor to introduce our guests today, Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, Donna Shalala, and Joyce Beattie. Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy represents Florida's 7th District. Before she was elected to Congress, Murphy served as National Security Specialist at the Department of Defense. She received the Secretary of Defense's Medal for Exceptional Civ Civilian Service. And then in 2016, Stephanie defeated her 12-year Republican incumbent opponent and became the first Vietnamese American to be elected to Congress, where she serves on the Ways and Means Committee. As co-chair of the Blue Dog Coalition, Congresswoman Murphy has been a champion for strong national security and fiscal responsibility during her time in Congress. Congresswoman Donna Shalala is a tra trailblazer in many ways, including the world of women in politics. Congresswoman Shalala served as the US Secretary of Health and Services under the Clinton administration, ultimately becoming the longest serving, and I would say one of the best ever secretaries of HHS in US history. 
She went on to serve as president of the University of Miami and president of the Clinton Foundation before being elected to represent Florida's 27th district and the House of Representatives. Representative Shalala continues to fight for a progressive agenda that upholds the constituents she is elected to serve and Americans everywhere. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty is a native Ohioan who has represented her district since 2013. She serves on the House Financial Services Committee and has used that position to help her district in notable ways, including securing nearly $4 million to address Columbus's infant mortality rate. Congresswoman Beatty is also vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Before coming to Congress, Congresswoman Beatty served as senior vice president of outreach and engagement at Ohio State University. And she served in the Ohio House of Representatives where she was the first female Democratic House leader in Ohio's history. To all of our panelists, I can't think of a better way to get ready for today's tonight's debate. Thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anne. And a reminder to all of our folks to submit questions to the Q&A feature on Zoom. To start us off, Anne just mentioned tonight's debate, which I know we're all really excited for. And we'll be watching Kamala Harris on the debate stage. She was the first woman of color to be nominated by a major party and is poised to potentially become the first female vice president, as Mark and Anne both alluded to. How do you think her life experiences, perspectives, and values will inform her decisions as VP? Uh, we'll go first to, to Congresswoman Murphy for this one. Thanks so much, Joel. Let me let me just first say before I answer your question that I'm so happy to be here with you all ahead of this important and exciting debate. I'm particularly happy to be here with Congresswoman Shalala and Congresswoman Beatty. Um, they're colleagues, friends, and and mentors. So um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And um, I'm also so proud that Senator Kamala Harris, our country's first AAPI vice presidential candidate will be taking the stage this evening. As to um, Senator Harris and, and what she brings to this, look, we're all products of our experiences and our environments. And it doesn't dictate how we think, but it does inform it. And when you come from a certain background or have a certain life experience, it can help you understand and empathize with folks who come from similar backgrounds or have similar experiences. And I think it, particularly in this moment, in the absence of this in our national leader, leadership, understanding and empathy are, are, are very um, important to good policymaking. Um, you know, it's, policy isn't, isn't just abs abstract or theoretical, it's very personal. You're affecting people's lives. It helps to understand these people so that when you make decisions, you're, you're um, making decisions that are right for them. And when I think of my life and when I speak to women in my district, I know that we tend to be passionate about policies that directly impact us, whether that's access to quality childcare or equal pay for equal work. And um, I think that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris um, have a hopeful and optimistic view of America where everyone has a fair shot at the American dream. And that's why I'm so proud to support them. I know that Kamala has a unique perspective as a woman, as someone with both Jamaican and Indian heritage. And this perspective, um, it's obviously has never been seen on the stage at a vice presidential debate. And um, I think Vice President Pence is unable to, and frankly, maybe unwilling to, put himself in the shoes of people that look and think differently than he does. But in contrast, Kamala knows that we have an obligation to work together to ensure that everyone, you know, regardless of their background or gender has a seat at the table. And the closer we get to making sure that the diversity within the US leadership reflects the great diversity of our entire country, I think the better we will be at governing and serving the people of the United States. Okay. Congresswoman Shalala. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues. I've never made friends so fast as I did in Congress, particularly among the women um, in Congress. It's been an awful lot of fun. People don't like when I say it's been fun to be in Congress, but uh, for me, it's just been a joy. Uh, I should say though, um, that you shouldn't be interviewing us, you should be interviewing Ann Lewis. She really is the pro here on, on all of these issues. 
Let me start by uh, saying a couple of things about Kamala Harris. I always thought that she was one of the strongest candidates, both initially for president as well as uh, uh, now for vice president, because she's had hard jobs. I like people that have had tough jobs, that have had to make tough decisions during the course of their career. And the thing about being a prosecutor is that you have to make really literally life and death decisions, decisions that affect uh, millions of people often. And in her case, both in San Francisco as well as for the state of California, she's just been in a situation in which you couldn't always please everyone and she had to make decisions. That's the kind of background you want for your vice president who may someday uh, be president of the United States, that's the kind of person that you want in the room. So I start with that and then add very much what my colleague just mentioned. And that is her multifaceted background, not just ethnicity, um, in which her ethnicity is clearly uh, uh, mixed, but she grew up black in America. She grew up actually in a working class neighborhood when I was secretary of HHS, I used to make it a point, my senior appointees all had different backgrounds because when you're approaching public policy, you want, you want people at the table with all due respect who don't just have Ivy League educations, but have come from different backgrounds, have different experiences, have made tough decisions in their lives. And, and that's what I really like about Senator Harris. Um, she's had a wide range of experiences. She's made tough decisions. Um, and yet she understands issues that involve women and families and will fight for them. We'll put everything on the line um, to fight for them, particularly for women and women's lives. She grew up with uh, uh, basically with a single mother um, and she has a deep understanding of the challenges um, that women have in our society. Um, and, uh, and, and she has a clarity of vision that we'll see tonight. Uh, there's, there's nothing mushy mm -hmm. about Senator Harris. She's very clear, very forthright, uh, very honest and feels deeply um, about what I think we're gonna to have to face in this country. Racism, broad disparities among, among different groups, a lack of opportunity. Um, and at her core, she believes that justice ought to apply no matter what your backgrounds are. And uh, she has demonstrated that over and over again. So. I think she's a remarkable human being and I'm just delighted that she's going to be the next vice president of the United States. Definitely. Congresswoman Beatty. Well, first of all, let me join my colleagues in saying thank you for doing this tonight. And it truly is a fun place to be when you can be with colleagues like Stephanie and, and with Donna. Stephanie and I were together uh, earlier uh, yesterday doing uh, Sojourner Truth Tuesday, uh, talking about strong women and talking about the beauty of diversity. When I think about my good friend and colleague, I get so excited, but I think she's the right person at the right time. And when I think about all the things that my colleagues have said, her, her background, uh, being embraced with the diversity of her grandparents and her parents, and also the intellect of their skills and her, her mother's life as a chemist, her father as a scholar, but here's the other thing. When you really sit down and you talk to her, she's a girlfriend. So what's so good about her is how she is shaped. She is shaped in the intellect, the legal background to put all of the complexities of what you have to read and study to do. She's already demonstrated that at the city level, the county level. She's now a US Senator and she was on that stage as a presidential candidate. 
So she has been vetted and she has been tested. But here's what I'd like to say in simple words when I talk about my good friend and colleague. When she talks about her mother, she calls her a warrior, that that's how she was raised. And when her mother talked about her, she talked about her resilience. So when you think of what that means, the, the strength and the tenacity, then think about what it takes to be a vice president. Think about the strength and the tenacity. Think about knowing when to be in the right place and what to do when you're in that place. That's what I think about her. I've had the opportunity to sit with her in our congressional Black Caucus meetings. I've had the opportunities to have a House bill and she carried it in the Senate. She's always on pulse. She's always thinking. She's always asking questions, but she's also caring. She's the first to call when something's wrong or you're not in the room. How are you? Do you need anything? And these were things that she said when she was going through the process of being selected as a vice president. She knew that my husband wasn't feeling well. And I looked at it and I said, that, that looks like it says Senator Harris. And she says, I'm on the road, but I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing, how he's doing. Kisses and hugs got to go. That's the kind of person that I want fighting to, for me when we're talking about freedom, when we're talking about healthcare being on the line, when we're talking about COVID-19 and being in an economic pandemic or a social justice pandemic. So as you can tell, I light up, I get passionate, I get excited about tonight. I can't wait to hear the debate. I'm so tired of pre-debate. I'm ready for the debate. Uh, to start. Awesome. Your enthusiasm is definitely clear to everybody on the call, I'm sure. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about kind of the House now. So Congresswoman Shalala, we'll start with you on this. Uh, when you left uh, the Clinton administration in 2001, uh, there were 65 women in the entire Congress. And that number is nearly doubled now to 127. I wish I could say it had fully doubled, but it was nearly doubled. You know, why do you think there's been such a huge increase? You know, what encouraged or enabled this change that we've seen um, you know, over your career. Oh, sorry, you're on mute right now. I apologize, Alison. Yes, I turned myself off just to be polite. Yeah. Um, if you look at the women who have been elected, the barriers for women getting elected um, for years, particularly uh, for Congress and in state legislatures, have been money, and we've broken that glass ceiling. Um, and uh, an opportunity to run in competitive districts as opposed to districts we couldn't possibly win. Um, and, um, but the third thing is, if you look at the women that were just elected, they all had jobs before they, and had professions. If you look at my class, it's full of former uh, military officers, national security officers, entrepreneurs. Um, um, they had had careers before they ran for office. Some of them had legislative careers before they ran for office, but they weren't newbies, uh, particularly. Many were newbies to politics, but they were already resilient and had networks that they could reach out to and we finally had a way of raising huge amounts of money through Emily's List, through other kinds of funds. So the combination of resources being available and, um, and, and women who had careers that were ready to step up and frankly, Title IX. Mm -hmm. This is the third wave of the modern American women's movement and it has literally made a difference. Definitely. Congressman Murphy, uh, slightly different question to you. you know, in 2018, the number of women in, in Congress went from 87, in the House went from 87 uh, to 101. You know, what changes did you notice um, just between the two different terms that you've been serving uh, that this kind of change brought about? Well, I, 
I mean, I was elected in 2016 in a year when Donald Trump not only won Florida, but he won the presidency. And so we were quite a small class coming in as Democrats who were able to flip a seat. And um, I'll have to tell you, um, I spent my first term trying to convince Capitol Police that I was a member of Congress. Um, and it didn't matter that I wore a member's pin and that, um, you know, I, I, I was headed to work to cast a vote or whatnot. I was consistently stopped at every checkpoint to double check my ID because they had spent decades working on the Hill and hadn't seen that many Asian American women, young women um, in Congress. And so what was really amazing about 2018 was that we finally had a class come in that represented the diversity of this country and represented what I know women can do. Women finally had had enough of the men in leadership screwing it up. And so all these women who, as Donna said, were accomplished women, were public servants, CIA agents, Navy officers, um, you know, people who had careers and lives and who believed in the core values of this country. And they decided to run, they, they threw their hat in the ring. And, um, and when they got to Congress, what was different was that the, Capitol Police doesn't ask me anymore for a double check of my ID because they're now getting used to the idea that congressional representation looks like the diversity of America. It finally is beginning to represent the diversity of America. And so it, it's great. I, I actually heard one of them at the very beginning of this Congress stop a male member, which I was a little bit surprised by, but also grateful that it isn't just women. And he asked him and he, you know, pointed at his pin and the guy was like, you guys just keep getting younger and younger. <laughs> but I think it's a good, it's a good, it's a step in the right direction. Awesome. Well, I know you have to, to leave us soon. So hopefully we might get around to another question from you, but if we don't, I want to thank you again for joining us. But, um, but yeah, thank you so much. Congressman Beatty, um, want to go to you with, again, slightly different variation on this. You know, 88 of the women in the House are Democrats, and only 13 of women in the House are Republicans. Why do you think there are so few women elected on the Republican side? You're all, yeah, I'm sorry, I need to. I think when we look at the differences of what we represent, I think when you look at Democrats, we see things. We see from the lens of mothers and grandmothers and uh, lawyers and, and doctors and we're nurturing. And so we saw that our country needed us because we look at the disparities. When you look at Democrats, we're also diverse. When you look at the women on the other side of the aisle, they don't have the diversity that we have, whether that's in age, whether that's where you're from, your race, your ethnicity. We have felt the pain and the disparities that Stephanie talked about. And so then we decide we should do something. Uh, I, I'd like to say, I think that we're more equipped or, or smarter or, or willing to fight, willing to get in the fight. When you hear our stories of how we grew up, when you hear how we landed from where, what our parents went through, many of our stories are saying. I heard Stephanie tell her story the other day and how amazing her story is, but I can reach back in my family and just put it in a different body of water, put it in a, a different situation, but it ends the same that someone helped us along the way. And then we saw how much we had to do to help others. We think that way. Look at the bills. Look at when you're talking about little children. How could anyone, let alone a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a female, stand on that floor and vote against something when you have children warehoused? 
Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about not the things that should be big and controversial, but just the, the nurturing thing. How could you not vote for healthcare with people with pre-existing conditions? So when we saw that there was a need for our voices, we saddled up, we strapped up, and we took all the tough questions. But here's the thing, we won. And we won against the odds. I can tell you when I came into Congress a little before both of my colleagues, there were 91 members, Democrat and Republicans in my class. One black woman. I was the only black woman out of 91 members elected that year. And since then, in each class, we've had just a great tapestry of diversity of women. So I think that's the difference. We, we fight for the issues. And I think for a long time, you did not see women. I serve on one of the exclusive committees in Congress. And I can tell you in my first term on that, there was not a female on the opposite side of the aisle in our committee, on the Financial Services Committee. We didn't have one female. And then guess what? We got one Republican female. And guess what else? That's all we still have today. So, you know, when you think about that, that says, speaks volumes about us as Democrats in a good way. Yeah. Uh, Congresswoman Murphy, I want to go, go back to you. Um, from 1977 to 1979, the state of Israel took in Vietnamese boat people fleeing the 1975 communist takeover of Vietnam. We know that your family fled communist controlled Vietnam in 1979 when you were six months old. It's probably a part of the story that Congresswoman Beatty says she heard you tell, and that your family was rescued by the United States Navy while you were at sea. Uh, can you touch on your family's journey to America and uh, did, did Israel's efforts to take in people affect uh, the community's view of Israel? Thanks, Joel, for that question. Um, and I, this is a story that I, I keep learning more and more about, but it was the intersection here is, um, is really actually quite incredible. So my family in the aftermath of uh, the end of the Vietnam War were among those who were persecuted by the communist um, government in Vietnam. They were rounding up people and sending them to what they called re-education camps. These camps were forced labor camps where many people um, suffered and many died. And so my parents looking at the possibility of raising two kids in fear and without freedom, without opportunity, made a really dangerous decision. They decided to escape by boat um, in the dead of night with a couple dozen other um, Vietnamese families. And I think, you know, they were looking, you know, they, they wanted like every parent wants is a better future for their kids than the one they had. And they looked at the, the options and they felt like, you know, they knew the journey was going to be dangerous, but they felt like it would maybe be better for us possibly to die in search of light than for us to live on in darkness in communist Vietnam. And so they got on this boat and they went to sea. And when they got to international waters, um, you know, so many boat people at that time encountered pirates and ICs and everything. And they encountered all of those things. And then they also ran out of fuel. And a US Navy ship found our tiny boat um, adrift, provided us with food, fuel, and water. And that enabled us to make it to the Malaysian refugee camp. But our story didn't end there. Here, all these people were so grateful to finally see land, but Malaysia was done with refugees. And so they would tow our little boat back out to international waters and my dad would captain us back in and they'd tow us back out. And finally, my dad said to everybody on the ship, you know, returning to Vietnam is not an option. And so what I need everyone to do is I'm gonna captain this ship in as close to shore as I can. And the women and children will jump and swim and the men will stay on this boat and help me scuttle it so that there is not a vessel for them to take us back. And so that's what they did. And that's how we ended up in a Malaysian refugee camp. And while we were in the Malaysian refugee camp, we didn't know this, but President Carter 
um, sent his vice president Mondale to the United Nations um, to Geneva. And there were so many Southeast Asian refugees at the time, it was quite a crisis. And he sent them there to, to give a speech. And the, the speech writer on the flight over is reviewing these documents and reviews documents from the 1930s and 40s. And he writes his entire speech around, let us not repeat the mistakes that we made with the Jewish refugees from the 30s and 40s. This is our opportunity as a community of nations to do what's right. And he says something to the effect of, if we succeed, history will never forget us. And if we fail, history will never forgive us. And as a result of this speech, the community of nations all lifted their um, their caps on ref Southeast Asian refugees. And I think that includes Israel joining this community of nations, um, understanding what it's like to be persecuted and providing safe haven and refuge for desperate strangers. And the United States lifted its, um, its cap as well, despite the fact that politically 65% of Americans were polling against accepting more refugees. And President Carter's administration did not only what was politically brave, but what was right. And he did it learning the lessons from the 1930s and 40s. And so, you know, for me, I think about those Jewish refugees in the 1930s and 40s, and particularly those on the ship from the St. Louis who were turned away and denied permission to disembark in Cuba and in Florida. And those men and women and children who were forced to go back to Europe, and many of them were murdered in the Holocaust. Unlike my family, the Jewish people in Europe back then didn't have a sanctuary to go to. And millions of Jews lost their lives as a result of evil on, on the part of Nazis. And as a result of indifference and inaction on the part of the international community. So the story of my journey to America always brings with it a sort of kinship to the Jewish people and a, a sense of gratitude um, for their sacrifices lighting the way for the community of nations to make better choices. Thank you so much. Um, so Congresswoman Shalala, we'll go to you next. Um, you've always been a strong supporter of the U.S. relationship. And for that, we are always very grateful, um, despite having had a very negative experience with Israel's airport security personnel. How did that experience at all affect your view of Israel? I just want to remind you to unmute yourself as you politely muted yourself while It actually didn't affect me at all. Um, you know, my, even though um, I had very liberal friends that um, I was stopped at the, at the airport, um, actually exiting Israel uh, for an hour, I was on a trip sponsored by um, uh, the Jewish community in the Jewish Federation in Miami. So they were all on the plane and they were furious that I was being held up. Well, it was my last name. I'm an Arab American. I was asked a lot of detailed questions, um, uh, but I refused to let it bother me because my view was, and my the statement that we issued afterwards uh, was that Israel has a right to protect its security. And if I had to be inconvenienced for an hour or so uh, because it was exercising that right, uh, that was fine with me. Um, I just. I just blew it off uh, at the time. And my ties to Israel as an Arab American are really quite deep. I'm the only member of Congress that has three honorary degrees from Israeli universities. I've been in and out of Israel uh, for probably 40 years, beginning uh, when I was at Hunter College when the Hunter alums asked me to go to Israel uh, with a lot of their money to help start women's studies at the Israeli universities. And that, that was probably my second trip to Israel uh, because I had wandered around the Middle East. I had served in the Peace Corps in Iran of all places and had literally been to Israel uh, early in, uh, in my career. Um, so I have long ties to Israel. The funniest thing 
about um, being held up at, uh, at the border um, is that um, uh, the Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu got up in the Knesset and basically made a speech about me saying when we hold up friends at the at the airport, um, um, this just should not happen. Uh, now I had known him for a long time when he was ambassador in New York to the UN from Israel. We were not exactly friends and our politics aren't particularly the same, but uh, my friends were all amused by that. So um, that particular incident didn't bother me at all. Um, I am for the two state solution I am very protective of the Palestinian people and very upset with their own leadership. Um, but I've been very clear about my support uh, of Israel right throughout my career. Definitely, a follow up for you. Um, some of your colleagues, particularly on, on the far left of our party, seem to have uh, become far less pro-Israel than yourself. Um, you know, what do you think uh, we can do to convince them of the importance of the US-Israel relationship? Are you asking me? Yes, yes. Just oh, yes. To you. I'm <laughs> sorry. Well, first of all, I think it's a very small minority of our colleagues. And um, within that minority, their concern is about the treatment of the Palestinian people. To be fair to them, um, they, uh, they want to make sure that our, our, our policies are balanced and that there, we really do achieve a two-state solution um, without discriminating against uh, Palestinians or Arabs in Israel uh, for many of them. Some of them you know, have real problems with Israeli politics and the Israeli government. But in terms of representation of the caucus, the caucus is deeply committed to the survival of Israel. But at the same time, uh, we also want peace in the Middle East. And um, uh, I think as a group, we're committed to a two-state solution. Definitely. Uh, Congresswoman Beatty, um, I don't think I'm, I'm giving away your age to say that you remember when Geraldine Ferraro was nominated as vice president. Um, I don't remember when Hillary Clinton came so close to the White House. And now we're about to watch our party's second female VP nominee walk out on the debate stage. Uh, can you compare and contrast your feelings at these uh, three kind of key moments for the Democratic Party? I think, in, and, and yes, thank you. And I clearly remember uh, all three uh, of those uh, occurrences. And I think at that time, they too were the right person we thought. We celebrated it, we were excited, and we believed that it was time for us to be there. And, and here's the good thing about it. We're standing on shoulders. Each one of them have learned from something from the last time. I mean, we thought we were really close with Hillary. She had been a secretary of state. She had been a first lady. She was brilliant. She authored uh, much of our healthcare legislation and was very quick to tell us that we needed that. And the people were voting for her. And I think she took a little piece of Geraldine. She probably reached back to a little bit of a Shirley Chisholm and all of the women who had come before her. And so I think tonight, I am sure that my good friend, Senator Harris is thinking about Michelle Obama and how she survived being out front. I am sure that she has taken a playbook from Hillary Clinton. And that's what we do. It's not about why this one didn't make it or proceed or what's the differences. It is because of those who come before us that we are here. If, there, if, if you look at, it, look at it from race and ethnicity and not just gender, gender, it's because there was a black president, that now there is a hope and a dream that we could have a black female vice president because Hillary Clinton came so close to being the president. So why not? So, and I think the other thing is, is not that we have to go back and look at Geraldine and we have to look at Hillary, 
Look at the number of women who were vetted to be vice president. Look at the diversity there. And no one was saying, oh, this is ridiculous. People were picking their favorites and people were saying, oh, it's difficult. I don't know if I want Tammy or do I want Karen or do I want Val or do I want Elizabeth? I mean, they all were surrounded by women. So I think for Kamala that tonight she's carrying all of them and their experiences with her. You know, she's remembering the things that were put before them and she'll be able to sort it out and do it in her own way. Awesome. I wonder, this will be our, our last question of the night. It must be for everybody. We'll go, we'll start first with, uh, we'll go back to you, Congressman Beatty for this, but first, but I'll go ahead and we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the recent passing of uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. uh, she rose to prominence battling for gender equality and was a role model for many women who felt the call to public service. What female leaders, you just talked about that we're all standing on the shoulders. You just mentioned that, Congressman Beatty, that we're all standing on the shoulders. What female leaders did you look up to in choosing a life for public service? Rosa Parks was the very per first person uh, when I started thinking about public service before being elected, uh, working with the NAACP, being a life member of the Urban League, volunteering, speaking out, and really trying to read everything that I could about civil rights. Because I can remember that's all my parents talked about at the kitchen table. So as a very young girl, it was Rosa Parks did this so you can graduate from school. Rosa Parks did this and got arrested so you can understand the importance of civil rights. And then there was a, a black lady by the name of Charity Early. If you Google her, she was the first wax African-American or black uh, to serve in the army. And she called herself a one woman army. And she was friends with people like Mary McLeod Bethune. By the way, we're getting a statue of her Florida. Uh, Donna, she was uh, another one. She was a very dear friend of my mother-in-law and um, my grandmother-in-law. So we grew up in the house hearing about Daisy Bates and Mary McLeod Bethune and Rosa Parks. For me, it was important because they looked like me. Their stories were like my mother's story and my grandmother's story and my mother-in-law's story. And that was very important for me, for my mother to give me things to read and share because she knew one day I would grow up and I wouldn't be under her. And that she used to say, this world can be very cruel to a little girl like you. So whenever you feel that you're in trouble, surround yourself. If you're giving a speech and people are looking at you and you're the only person in the room, just look over them and say, there's Rosa and there's Shirley Chisholm and there's Mary McLeod Bethune. And she said, you'll get through it. So I stand on all of those great women who look like me and their shoulders. And then I stand on the shoulders of a Hillary Clinton, someone that I had to be very close with and was there on the night that she asked me to speak right before she took the nomination at the Democratic Convention. So there are a lot of women's women. And right now, Nancy Pelosi, I think she is one of the most powerful, strongest uh, females that I get to serve with and get to be a co-chair for Sojourner Truth Tuesday. Congresswoman uh, Shalala, it's gonna be you next. You know, when I was uh, um, a little kid, I can tell you the part in the Cleveland Library that had these biographies of famous women. And I remember reading them about Rosa Parks and Jane Double D Adams. I mean, there was a whole generation uh, of women. Um, I'd have to say my mother, who was the first Lebanese American uh, to go to college from our community. She went to Ohio State, by the way, uh, Joyce. Uh, and, um, and ended up going to law school with the support of my father who only had an eighth grade education. Uh, but she was, um, she was the only woman in her law school class um, and um, graduated from law school and practiced uh, law for a number of years. When I first went into government, I worked for an African-American woman named Patricia Roberts Harris 
who is the first African-American woman um, to be a cabinet officer. And Pat Harris took me under her wing. And she was the toughest woman I've ever met in my whole life. Uh, but boy, she, uh, she taught me a lot about survival in Washington. And of course, a, a number, I knew Jerry Ferraro and Gloria Steinem, I mean, uh, and Sally Ride, I mean, a whole, and of course, I've been a longtime friend of uh, Hillary Clinton's and also of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was, I was a colleague of on the faculty at uh, uh, Columbia. And all of us worship Nancy Pelosi, uh, the most skilled woman politician of, um, of our generation. Awesome. Thank you. Congresswoman Murphy? I would say Madeleine Albright. Um, and, you know, Madeleine Albright was a naturalized US citizen, and, and I am too. And I remember. Um, being maybe 10, 11, 12, helping my mom study for her um, US citizenship test and you know, quizzing her and trying to make sure that she could nail all the questions because my citizenship depended on her performance. And, um, and, and then I remember um, standing on, uh, in front of the judge with that little American flag they give you when you become naturalized and taking my oath of citizenship. And I was so proud, um, I don't know, about three decades later for my son to stand on the house floor with me holding that same little flag that I had saved um, while I took an oath to become the first Vietnamese American woman ever to serve in Congress. And I will never forget the story that Madeleine Albright told me. She said, you know, she was presiding over a naturalization ceremony, which is a really cool thing that I've gotten to do since being in office. But she was presiding over the ceremony and this gentleman who was a new American and so grateful and feeling all the things that my mom and I felt so many years ago. He said, I can't believe Madeleine Albright is um, presiding over my uh, citizenship, my naturalization. And she said to him, um, you know, that she was a refugee and an immigrant and a naturalized citizen who is the Secretary of State presiding over his naturalization ceremony. And so she's always been such um, a, a, a role model, I think for what is possible, especially among those of us who aren't lucky enough to be born here, but who love this country deeply, um, maybe not despite it, but because, because of that. Well, I, I wanna thank you all, Congresswoman Shalala, Congresswoman Murphy, and Congresswoman Beatty for joining us. And we are so grateful for your time, particularly with all the demands that we know are on your schedule, particularly on days like today. I'm gonna bring on Alma, Alma Hernandez, our newest uh, DMFI board member to say a few final words. But first, let me introduce you to her for those of you that don't know her. Representative Alma Hernandez was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. At home in Tucson, she worked as the program coordinator for Bridging the Gap, a program that helps women living with HIV AIDS. She also led Arizona United for Healthcare, working to defeat the repeal of the Affordable Care Act by being a voice for the underserved, the uninsured and the underrepresented. At the age of just 25, she became the youngest member of the Arizona House of Representatives and the first Mexican-American Jew to win an elected position in Arizona. Representative Hernandez serves on the Health and Human Services Committee and the Federal Relations Committee at the Arizona House of Representatives. We are delighted to have her serving as our newest board member. Go ahead, Alma, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Hi, good evening, and thank you all so much for, for joining us. And I want to First and foremost, thank the Congresswomen who are on here and sharing their stories. I am just, I, I'm so excited to see you all, but you have incredible stories and I'm very proud to be on this call with you all. So as Joel mentioned, my name is Alma Hernandez and I'm proud to serve as one of the new board members for DMFI. And thank you all to our panelists and everyone who joined the presentation today. We really appreciate it. Um, as you heard from Mark a little earlier, uh, DMFI is the only organization fighting to ensure the Democratic Party remains strongly pro-Israel. 
Uh, but we cannot do this without the support and help from people who care about these issues as much as we do. So if you care about overcoming those challenges and achieving those goals, please join us in our work today. Uh, while many of you are already in front of your computers or on your phones, um, I encourage you to visit dmfi.org um, to sign up for more, of our, for more information by us um, or to get invitations for other programs that we have throughout the year or make a donation. Um, if you want to learn more about DMFI and how you can get involved, you can reach out to us on our website or also send an email at info at dmfi.org. Um, and again, I just want to thank you all, the participants and those who spoke today. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you all at our next two pre-presidential pre debates. Thank you all and enjoy the debate. We're so excited to watch Kamala kill it today. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.